Hello everyone this is part 25 of what if Naruto was the devil ninja, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to share, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Join my membership the perks are great, it's in the description. After breakfast, Naruto and the others were directed toward the carriages by Greyfear and Azazel. Rias was given a hearty goodbye from her father and mother. They were going to be attending the tournament, but they would arrive separately. Milikas had said goodbye to Naruto. He would apparently be going to the tournament with Rias's parents and Greyfear. Sirex had already left. Milikas has taken quite a shine to you, Rias said as the carriages started up. Naruto leaned back in his seat. Yeah. Your mom's been tutoring us. I guess we both bonded over the torture. Rias raised an eyebrow. Torture. I meant lessons. Lessons. The look that Rias gave him said she didn't believe a word he had just said. Right. The coach had two seats facing each other. Naruto sat on one side with Ravel and Koneko. He was in the middle. Rias sat on the other with Office and Irina. Originally, Office had tried to sit on Naruto's lap, but Rias, Koneko, and Ravel had put a stop to that. The infinite dragon god had been pouting ever since. The others had gotten onto another carriage, he hoped they were okay. Considering the tension that still existed between Akino, Asia, and Issei, the carriage itself was probably intense. He felt sorry for Kiba and Gasper. What kind of things is Lady Gremory teaching you? Asked Irina. Mostly politics and stuff, Naruto said, leaning back and crossing his arms. She's been doing her best to pound everything about the 72 pillars and how the devil hierarchy operates. She said it would be important to know later on down the road. She's right, Rias said. Since you and I are dating, you'll need to know about our culture and politics for future events that you might have to attend. She looked at Ravel, then back at him. It's even more imperative since you're also dating Ravel. With two heiresses on your arm, I don't doubt that you'll become the center of attention once it's made public. While Ravel and Irina became beat red, Naruto frowned. I didn't think about that. Is it okay for me to be dating two heiresses? It's not unheard of, Rias told him. But it's still pretty rare. I don't think a polygamous relationship like this has happened in a couple hundred years. T this has happened before. Irina asked. Rias nodded. Polygamy isn't unusual in devil society though most devils prefer monogamous relationships. About 250 years ago, a powerful devil heiress called Felicia Andrialfis gained great fame as a powerful devil who had subjected several other high-class devil families. She had then forged numerous alliances by having the first male of each family marry her. Ha, huh, so female devils also form harems, Naruto said. He didn't know why this surprised him. Of course they do. Devil society isn't patriarchal like human society tends to be. We're an egalitarian society. That's why devil families have both a patriarch and a matriarch, each of whom are in charge of running the day-to-day -day affairs of the house. Rias paused, and then added. Of course, there are cases where the male or female will hold more power within the house, but that comes down to a matter of in-house principles instead of societal laws. In the eyes of society, men and women are equal. That makes, Irina said, nodding. Naruto frowned. But if that's the case, then why is Greyfear a maid? Isn't she also Sirek's wife? That, Greyfear just likes being a maid. Rhea shrugged as though to say, that's how it goes. H ha, huh, I see. The carriage took them to the train station, where the Gremory Peerage Plus friends were forced through a sea of Rhea's Gremory fans. There was a large horde of them. They carried signs, screamed Rias's name, and proclaimed their undying love for her. Naruto supposed they were lucky that the family had prepared for this. Both Venelana and Zeotikus's peerages were there in full force, keeping the crowd at bay and allowing them space to walk. Naruto hadn't personally met with the peerages of Rias's mother and father. He didn't really know them. However, he'd seen them around the mansion occasionally. They had only been glimpses, but Naruto thought he recognized a few of them. I still can't believe how popular Buku is, Issei mumbled as they entered the train. The doors slid closed behind them and everyone made themselves comfortable somewhere. 
Naruto sat with Issei and Kiba while the girls took the circular couch in the center and began chatting. Rias is something of a special case, Kiba admitted. Most devils don't get that kind of treatment unless they're famous like one of the four mouse or a popular rating game player. What makes her so special? Asked Issei. Rias helped care for the cities located within her clan's domain, Naruto answered before Kiba could. Before coming to the human world, she was well known for traveling to various cities and doing community service acts, or playing with the local children. She also helped all of the reincarnated devils adjust to life in the underworld. So she's popular because she's nice and helpful. Yes. Sounds like our buku. Definitely. Naruto smiled. That's my Rias. Hey, you're Rias. Kiba teased. Instead of getting embarrassed, Naruto puffed out his chest. Of course. Rias and I are dating. That's why she's my Rias. HMPH. Kiba snorted with laughter. You're really something else. I'm so jealous that you get to fondle those ginormous juggle bags, Issei said with a sigh, lying his face on the table. So not fair. Don't let Asia catch you saying that, Kiba said. I I didn't mean that I don't like Asia's op I. I just meant. Naruto tuned the two out and looked out the window as the train sped along the tracks, watching the passing scenery roll by. It looked like they were in a mostly forested area. He could see nothing except trees up close and mountain ranges in the distance. While he let his mind wander, Issei continued to ask Kiba questions. So, where are these rating games taking place? At the Ma'u Colosseum, Kiba answered. It's located in the capital. The Colosseum was created about 40 years ago to host the rating game championships. Since this tournament is such a big deal, they've decided to host it there. Oh, that makes sense, I guess, Issei said. Kiba grinned. Just wait until you see it. The Colosseum is quite impressive. It turned out that Kiba's words of, quite impressive, was something of an understatement. The Colosseum was massive, gargantuan on a scale that Naruto, and probably everyone who hadn't already seen it, couldn't fathom. It was on the opposite side from where the party had been held, which explained why they hadn't been able to see it the first time they'd arrived. Now, standing before it as it loomed over them, Naruto couldn't help but be in awe by the immensity of it. This is where rating games take place. Naruto asked. Just the championships, Rias answered. The rest of this time, the Colosseum is used for other events that are often hosted annually. I see. Grafia was waiting for them when they arrived. She led them to an entrance near the back, away from the crowds gathering by the front gate. This allowed them to slip inside and take a hallway that led to a large and opulent room where all of the other members who would be taking part in the tournament had gathered. Sirex and the other alliance leaders will be along shortly to explain how this tournament will work, Grafia informed them. Please wait here. After Grafia wandered out of the room and shut the door, Naruto looked at all of the people already there. Several of them had turned their heads to see who had entered. However, once they realized who it was, most went back to what they'd been doing. The only ones who greeted them were Angelus, Gomery, Lix, Ruel, and Cyrog, each of whom tossed them a smile or waved. Naruto waved back before turning to the others. Should we greet the Kampion? Let's, Rias said, smiling. Since there were only two peerages mixing, Angelus and Cyrog, the Gremory peerage went up to them. Angelus greeted them with her kind smile. Meanwhile, Cyrog stared at Naruto with a grin. You seem a little stronger than the last time we met, he said. So do you. Naruto returned the grin. I can tell you've been training. Were you that worried about me kicking your ass? Ha. Huh. I just want to make sure everyone sees me at my best. While Naruto traded good-natured shots with Cyrog, Rias spoke to Angelus. That's a lovely outfit, she complimented. But are you sure it's appropriate for the tournament? I'd hate to see it get ruined. Angelus was wearing a pure white gown that flattered her feminine figure. It was a simple outfit, with none of the ostentatiousness that a devil would have added were they wearing the same thing. It suited a girl like her. It will be okay, Angelus said. I'm not a close-range fighter, so I don't expect to be in the thick of battle during the tournament. Lady Angelus won't get anywhere near the fight because I'm going to protect her, Kazuma said. I won't let anyone lay a hand on her. Yes. Angelus smiled at Kazuma. I'll be counting on you, Kazuma-kun. Kazuma blushed as Rias giggled, which just caused him to blush more. 
The other members of the Gremory peerage tried to chat with the people in Cyrog's peerage and Angelus's aces. Sadly, they weren't quite as successful. They didn't have Naruto's uncaring attitude toward rank, status, and race, nor did they have Rias's poise while dealing with others. About the only two who successfully made conversation with anyone else was Asia and Issei, and it was mostly Asia doing all the talking. It's so wonderful that you were able to be reincarnated as an angel, Asia said to a young woman who looked several years older than the others. You must have been truly blessed during your life. I'm actually a little jealous. I don't know if I would call myself, blessed, the woman who introduced herself as Saria Steelix said. Fortunate might be a better word. Is that so? Still, it must be amazing to become an angel. It is a pretty neat experience, Saria admitted. And, how about you? Do you think becoming a devil was a sign of fortune? Oh, yes. Asia nodded. I've met so many wonderful people since I've become a devil, and I have a wonderful boyfriend, and there's also. Also, Saria queried. Asia shook her head. Um, no, never mind that. Please forget I said anything. Well, all right. During the midst of the several conversations taking place between them, someone else walked up to the group. He was a handsome young man. With a gentle-looking face, blonde hair, and an outfit befitting royalty, he held an appearance reminiscent to a fairy tale prince. He reminded Naruto of Kiba, except he felt Kiba pulled off the princely look better. The vile aura radiating from him, which Naruto felt thanks to his ability to sense the darkness in others, helped shatter the illusion that he was anything but cruel. Excuse me, he said, bowing politely to the group. I apologize for interrupting your conversation, but could I ask, might you be Asia Argento? Asia blinked. Um, yes, that's me. The smile that the man wore widened. I thought so. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Diodora Astaroth, and I wanted to confess my love for you. A. There was no telling whether that came from Asia or Issei. Naruto glanced at his friend. The look on Issei's face, which could have best been described as flabbergasted, was amusing, would have been amusing had the situation not been so odd. Attention had enveloped the area. Naruto felt something thick in the air. What will you do now, eyes? T that's very kind of you, Asia said. However, um, I already have someone that I like, so. I see. For just a moment, Diodora's face darkened. In that case, all I need to do is make you love me more than him. His smile returned. I think you'll find that I'm determined to make you mine. Asia didn't seem like she knew how to respond, she remained silent, a look of befuddlement crossing her face. It was perhaps fortunate, then, that Issei finally snapped out of his shock and stepped in front of her. Sorry, bud, but Asia's my girlfriend. I don't care if you like her. I get that she's adorable and all, but it's rude to try and steal someone else's girl. Is that so? Diodora narrowed his eyes. Naruto felt a moment of bloodlust that went unnoticed by everyone save perhaps Rias, Cyrog, and Angelus. Then the smile returned. I see. So that would make you my rival, wouldn't it? Be prepared, dragon. I will make Asia mine. Diodora turned around and went back to his peerage, which Naruto noticed was made up entirely of nuns. He didn't get a chance to ask Rias about that. Seconds after the confrontation ended, the doors opened and several people walked in. Cyrex, Michael, and Azazel were easily recognizable. So was Metatron, but there were others that he wasn't as familiar with. A woman whose beauty transcended human comprehension and a handsome man with raven-colored hair and green eyes. Hello, everyone, Michael said, stepping forward and greeting everyone present with a smile. We would like to welcome all of you to the first annual Three Factions Tournament. Since this is the first time we're doing this, there are a number of rules that we'll need to explain before determining who fights who. At this point, Cyrex took a step forward and began to speak. The only real rules that we have should be obvious, there is no killing and we can end the fight at any time should it become clear that one side will be the victor. Those who do not follow these two rules will be disqualified and barred from taking part in future tournaments. There are some other factors about this tournament that you should also be aware of, Azazel added. All the battles will be fought in a dimension that has been created by us. You can pretty much go crazy in there. Each arena is the exact same size as the Colosseum's interior, mostly because the dimension created is using the Colosseum as an anchor to maintain its reality. Battles will be determined by a random drawing. 
After that, they will go forward in a typical tournament fashion. He sighed. Well, that about covers it. Are there any questions? I've got one, Naruto said, raising a hand. He felt a grin split his face. When do we get this party started? Azazel laughed. Right now. The blonde female angel stepped forward. There was a box in her hand, and there was a hole on the top portion. Will each of the leaders please step forward and grab a slip of paper? Once you have it, show your number to Shemhazai. One by one, those who were the king of their respective groups walked toward the blonde woman and drew a card. The card was then shown to the fallen with dark hair, Shemhazai, and then they walked back to the group. What number did you draw? Naruto asked Rias as she stopped beside him. Eight. Rias said. After the last person drew a number, Shemhazai took several steps forward and spoke in a clear tone. The battles will be happening as follows. Baal vs. Mestama. Bua vs. Lix. Gremory vs. Ruel. Astaroth vs. Citri. Gomery vs. Glacier Labolas. And Angelus vs. Agares. Will the first two contestants please follow us? You will be lead to your respective starting points. All right. It looks like we're going first, Mestama crowed. Come on, losers. It's time to show these s who's top dog around here. Have fun, Cyrog, Naruto said as the large teen walked off with his peerage. Cyrog said nothing, but he did raise a hand as if to say farewell. Devil Ninja. Cyrog Bale looked at his surroundings with a consternated frown. The strangely made grey walls, numerous unusual shops, and large steel poles that went from the ground to the ceiling were unknown to him. He'd never been to a place like this before. The arena they stood in was large, massive on a scale that he couldn't quite describe. Of course, it wasn't big in comparison to a city, but when compared to the inside of, say, a mansion, it was ridiculous. The ceiling was nearly 50 meters above his head, and the interior extended for miles, with staircases and elevators and fountains. It also looked like there were multiple stores inside of this building, which meant it was a shopping district of some kind. Kursha, what sort of playing field is this? He asked. His queen, a girl around his age with blonde hair tied into a ponytail, studied the interior with a keen eye. If I am not mistaken, I believe our current playing field is a mall, the kind you would find in the human world. None of us have any experience with human malls, Cyrog muttered, frowning. I believe this was done to even the playing field, Kursha admitted. Mestama has no experience in a rating game, but he probably knows more about the human world than we do. They've given him a terrain advantage in order to counter our experience advantage. Yeah, that makes sense. What should we do? Asked Coriana Andrialphus, one of his bishops. I don't particularly like the way Mestama treated Angelus during the party, so I kind of want to pound his entire peerage into the ground myself, Cyrog admitted. Kursha coughed into her hand. While you may not like him or the way he acts, please remember that if you were to humiliate him during a live spectacle like this, it could result in serious political consequences between devils and the fallen angels. I do not believe the governor general would mind, Beruka said whilst sitting atop Autobrow, a devil horse from Cassitis, the lowest part of the underworld. He struck me as the kind of guy who would laugh at someone who's been humiliated rather than get upset on their behalf. That may be the case, but Azazel is not the only fallen angel we have to worry about, Kursha reprimanded Cyrog's knight. We would have to worry about much more than just the fallen's governor general. Metama might have friends in high places. Hmm, Cyrog thought about the problem for a moment, before grinning. All right, everyone. Here's what we're going to do. Devil Ninja. Because the rating game was taking place in a separate dimension, all battles were watched on several monitors arrayed throughout the arena. These monitors were massive contraptions that hovered over the arena floor. Each one was large enough that it put any theater in the human world to shame. The peerage and St. members were not within the arena proper, where all of the other guests were watching the battle. They were still in the waiting room. However, they could watch the battle play out on a large monitor attached to the southernmost wall. Naruto was sitting on one of several couches, with his girlfriend and queen sitting on his left, holding his hand, their fingers laced. Koneko was on his other side. She was using his lap as her pillow. Irina, Ravel, and Office were nowhere to be found. Since they weren't members of Rias's peerage, they had been asked to leave. While Irina and Ravel had gone off with Grafia, Office had just disappeared. He didn't know where she was. Everyone, including Naruto, 
was watching the battle play out on the monitor. It looked like Cyrog and his team were moving into a full-out attack despite not knowing where Mestama was. Meanwhile, the Fallen was having his, peerage, plant traps around them all. His members had split up, moving to various key points and intersections. It looked like they were setting spells that would go off when they detected motion near them. It looks like Cyrog is splitting up his forces, Rias commented with a small frown. She had even placed a hand under her chin. Naruto recognized her expression and posture as the, I wonder what he's up to. Position, which was the name he had given to it. Do you think that was a bad move? Naruto asked, using his free hand to run his fingers through Koneko's hair. If this were any other peerage, I would probably say yes, Rias said. The frown on her face grew deeper. But Cyrog and his peerage are hailed as one of the strongest peerages among the younger devils. Cyrog in particular. He's called the strongest youth. That's not a lie he came by lightly. Naruto nodded. I agree. Mestama was smart to set traps, but something tells me those traps aren't going to work on Cyrog or his peerage. Devil Ninja. Kuisha walked through the mall with confident strides. Her dress ruffled about her ankles. The slit on her right side caused her leg to occasionally reveal itself, all the while her blonde ponytail swished as she looked left and right. No traps had presented themselves yet, but, hum, the ground underneath her suddenly exploded, plumes of crimson flame erupting and causing chunks of concrete to fly everywhere. Kuisha had no interest in being consumed by the fire. Seconds before the explosion actually happened, she was leaping through the air. While the heat from the flames still washed over her face, no damage had been sustained. She landed on the ground. Kneeling on the tiled floor, she held out her left hand and created a magic circle. It was an elemental circle that represented water. Mass amounts of blue liquid shot from the circle and slammed into a wall several meters away. It drilled straight through the wall seconds later, and Kuisha held out her other hand, from which lightning poured forth. It combined with the water, creating a beam of almost pure white light. The beam slammed into the room on the other side. An explosion of electricity sent light tendrils skittering out of the hole in the wall like spiders. Along with the attack's aftermath, a figure leapt out of the hole. They were young, but appeared older than her by a few years. His dark hair hung from his head and swayed in the breeze left over by the discharges of her attack. She noticed the twitching in his arm. He must have been feeling the aftermath of her attacks. I applaud you on your trap-building skills, Kuisha complimented the man. You are quite talented. It looks like I can't afford to hold back with you. I'm afraid you have me mixed up with Liz, the fallen angel said. I'm not the one who created these traps. That achievement goes to Laurelie, the ace of our little group. She was the one who created the traps. Myself and the others just placed them in locations that she chose. So I see, Kusha said. She shrugged. Well, I suppose it doesn't matter. After all, you've already lost. What? The fallen angel barely had time to comprehend what was happening before the ground underneath him disappeared. He screamed. Before he could disappear into the hole, the ground closed up around him, trapping him from the neck up. W what the hell is this? The fallen asked frantically. He moved his head around as though trying to escape, but nothing happened. Discharges of energy caused the ground to rumble. Nothing happened. Why can't I get out of here? My powers aren't working. It's because I won't let you, Kuisha said. The House of Abaddon has the power of hole, which is the ability to create holes that expand and contract according to the user's will. It can also absorb and reflect attacks. D.A. Damn it. The Fallen screamed before disappearing in a burst of red light particles. Fallen Angel Lysias has been retired, a voice announced. Kuisha nodded and walked away. Devil Ninja. One by one, all of Mestama's, Peerage, followed Lysias. It seemed that just knowing more about the general layout of human malls was not enough to defeat more experienced players. There were a few among Mestamas, Peerage, who stood out, such as the only female member who could turn her light spear into various forms like whips and swords, but by and large, they weren't very impressive. Didn't all of the people participating in this tournament undergo special training? Naruto asked Rias. Yes, they did. Then why are Mestamas Peerage so weak? It's because Mestama chose not to let any devils or angels train his group, a voice said behind them. Naruto looked up to see Lix standing behind their couch.
She was looking down at him with her no-nonsense eyes. Mestama is an extremely headstrong person, and he hates the fact that he wasn't able to make a name for himself during the war between the three factions. I guess he feels cheated out of his rightful glory, or something like that. Because he's so proud, he doesn't want to interact with angels or devils. And what do you think about the alliance? Asked Rius. I think it's a good idea, Lix said, tilting her head to the left. I don't much care for war, so forming an alliance with the people we were fighting against for mutual benefit makes more sense to me. That said, Lix looked around at all of the people participating in the tournament. Her expression remained unchanged, but a sense of annoyance appeared to come from her. I could do without this tournament. It's a waste of time. You don't think having a tournament to foster understanding and friendship is a worthwhile endeavor? Rias asked. Naruto winced at the tone in her voice. She had been the one who had proposed the tournament idea to Cyrex. Lix shrugged. I believe that the party was fine, but this tournament is taking time away from all of the things I could have been doing. Such as. Such as finishing my Dujin. You create Dujin. And just like that, Rias no longer appeared angry. The frown left to be replaced by a smile. Naruto could practically see the stars in her eyes. What kind of Dujin do you make? The best kind, Lix said, and finally, Naruto watched as a smile graced her face. I'll show it to you once I'm finished. He turned back to the rating game as Rias and Lix began to talk in earnest. Koneko purred underneath his gentle ministrations. Devil Ninja. Cyrog found Mestama, though it might have been more accurate to say that Mestama found Cyrog. He had been walking through the mall without a clear destination in mind. Numerous traps had detonated around him, but he weathered them all. Small explosions like that would not be able to break past his durable body. At some point, Mestama must have become desperate and launched an all-out attack in the form of several dozen light spears. Wearing a large grin, Cyrog watched as the spears rained down on him. He didn't move. Each spear came and struck him head on, then shattered against his skin. The only sign that he had been attacked were the small black scorch marks on his body. I was wondering when you'd finally decide to face me in person, Cyrog said, looking at the area where the attacks had come from. There didn't appear to be anything there at first, but then, like the wavering form of a ghost, Mestama appeared. He must be able to bend light around his body. That was a pretty high level skill, bending light around something wasn't as simple as creating a light spear. The fact that he could do such a concentration intensive technique spoke well of Mestama's abilities. Not that it will help him here. You, Mestama scowled at him, his face distorted with inhuman anger. You destroyed my peerage. Cyrog shrugged. Technically, my own peerage destroyed your peerage, but you should have expected that. You didn't come at us with any real plan. You just set a bunch of traps and a few ambushes in the hopes that it would finish us off. Do you even know of tactics? Shut up. Mestama howled. Several light spears appeared from the ether and shot forward. Cyrog took each one head on without flinching, letting them break off his body like they were simple paper projectiles. If this is the level of power behind his attacks, I won't even need to use Regulus. I'm going to give you a chance to surrender now, Cyrog said. If you don't, I'll defeat you with my next attack. That's not going to happen. I'm going to defeat you. I will. Cyrog sighed as more light spears broke against his skin. They stung a little, which couldn't be helped since they were made of light, a devil's natural enemy. Even so, these attacks were so weak they did little more than sting. Useless. Cyrog slid his feet apart, reared his fist back, and, expelling a deep breath, threw a punch. The air in front of him was rent. Fierce, howling winds exploded, the very atmosphere seeming to distort. Mestama, his desperation showing on his face, created several shields to defend against the attack. They were for naught. The power of Cyrog's punch smashed through every shield put up before plowing into Mestama. The fallen angel was thrown backwards. He crashed into a wall, through the wall, and disappeared in a cloud of dust. Cyrog waited several seconds to see if Mestama would emerge. Mestama has been retired. Victory goes to Cyrog Bale. Devil Ninja. Okay, Naruto spoke into the silence after the battle's conclusion. That was pretty badass. Of course you would think that, Rias said, smiling. Men like you think anything that's all power and no precision is awesome. 
I don't want to hear that from you most powers of destruction. Rias leaned into him, her head close to his ear, her body pressed against his arm. He could feel her be. It was hard not to. They were quite large. If you'd like, I can show you how precise I am later tonight. Naruto's arm was pinned, but that didn't mean he could just let her get away with teasing him. I might just take you up on that. They were so close now. A mere centimeter or two was between them. Naruto was just about ready to lean down and claim her lips in AK. You two might want to stop before you start making out on the couch, Koneko interrupted them. You're making everyone else uncomfortable. Naruto and Rias jerked apart. They looked down at Koneko, whose head still rested on Naruto's lap. Then they looked at everyone else. The other people present were staring at them. Some, like Angelus and Irina, were blushing up a storm, while others, such as Issei and, well, just Issei, were bleeding from the nose. Don't you people have something better to look at? Naruto asked. Not really, Lix said from behind him. So me flirting with my girlfriend is interesting to you. More interesting than anything else going on. The rating game is over, in case you forgot. As if emphasizing her point, the doors opened and Cyrog and his peerage walked in. They weren't alone. Along with them were the four Satans, Michael and the blonde woman, and Azazel, Savazai, and a face that Naruto vaguely recognized but needed a moment to place. The man walking alongside Azazel and Savazai looked like an older man in his mid to late forties. His dark hair seemed to complement his tan, leathery skin. He also had a full beard. The outfit that he wore looked almost like a military uniform, a black bodysuit with occasional gold highlights, and it was covered by a cloak. That's Barakil, if I'm not mistaken, so, Akino's father. Naruto didn't have much to do with Akino, so he only knew of Barakil thanks to Issei. He and Akino were apparently on bad terms. Naruto didn't know why this was, and it wasn't really something he could solve without appearing nosy. Aside from that, he believed that if anyone should help Akino get over her daddy issues, it was Issei, even if the two of them were no longer dating. The first battle has concluded, Michael said. It was a lot shorter than we had expected it to be, so we plan on having one more match before concluding the first day of the tournament. Will Burr and Lix please follow us to their starting points? Burr and Lix, along with their respective, peerage, members, left with the entourage of high-class supernatural beings. Well, Naruto mumbled to himself, I wonder how this battle will play out. Devil Ninja, Lix won. Naruto didn't know how surprised he was by that, but he had been pretty astonished by her sense of tactics and prowess in battle. Burr had been no joke either. He had used a combination of feints and blitzkrieg tactics to try and whittle away at Lix's peerage. It probably would have worked, but Lix had only feigned being pushed back, giving away ground until the very last second when she unleashed a trap that defeated Burr and his entire peerage in a single stroke. Rias had been taking notes on the battle, she had even put on her glasses, which she now kept in a carrying case in her left bee pocket. Naruto figured she was studying up on potential opponents should the time come for her to fight them. That was what he would have done, if he cared enough to do such a thing. That battle had taken up most of the day. Everyone who had attended had been sent back home with the knowledge that the next fight would begin again tomorrow. Since it would have been a waste to head back to the Gremory estate, the members of Rias's peerage plus their friends were given accommodations within Lilith. Seeing how it was his first time staying in Lilith, Naruto had decided to go exploring. Rias was busy. She had told him that she wanted to compile the data that she had collected during the battles, to see if there was anything useful that she could use. Naruto had respected her wish. That was also why he was traveling through the city with Koneko. Her tails and ears were no longer visible. Nekosho like her were hated in the underworld, thanks to what her sister had done, so she needed to hide her feline features. Naruto thought it was a shame. He liked her Neko appendages. Still, he knew there would be trouble if she walked around with cat ears and a tail. There's a sweet shop around here that I wanted to show you, Koneko told him as she led Naruto by the hand. The streets were pretty crowded. There must have been thousands of people wandering the streets, chatting and shopping and eating at local cafes and restaurants. Everyone was wearing smiles. It wasn't exactly what Naruto had expected from the underworld's denizens, but he knew from experience that hell and its residents were nothing like what humans thought. So, basically, 
You want me to buy you sweets and be your personal golfer, right? Naruto asked. Koneko smiled and held his arm to her chest. It's rare that I get you all to myself, so I'd like to make the most of our time together. Besides, Ria's Buku has been hogging you all to herself. It's not fair. She is letting you and the others sleep with us, Naruto pointed out. But whenever we're awake and out doing things, she's with you, Koneko countered. I'd like to spend some time with you without anyone else. Naruto conceded her point. He wouldn't have been surprised to learn that Rias had decided not to come with him because she knew this as well. While most devils were greedy, and his girlfriend was no exception to that rule, she had a soft spot for her peerage and those she considered friends. She'd go out of her way to help them, spend time with them despite her busy schedule, and be there when they needed someone to talk to. In that manner, at least, she was quite selfless. Do you know where this sweet shop is? Asked Naruto. It's on Lucifer Street, Koneko replied. This way. The sweet shop that Koneko lead him to was known as Sadao Sweets. Its architecture was different than what he was used to seeing. The roof was circular, like a dome, and the building was made of bricks instead of concrete. Inside of the shop was an enormous selection of sweets. Aisles upon aisles extended all the way to the back. Naruto didn't know if they were human or devil variations, since he couldn't tell the difference between the two. Welcome to my, well, if it isn't Koneko, a man said in greeting. He was a thin man with messy black hair and red eyes. I haven't seen you since you were a young child. How have you been? Sadao-san, Koneko greeted. I've been doing okay. How are you? I'm getting by, Sadao said, looking at Naruto. So, who is this? Your boyfriend. I suppose you could say that, Naruto said. I'm Naruto Uzumaki. I know who you are. Sadao shook Naruto's hand. You guys are all over the news lately. You and those other groups who are in the tournament. Naruto was about to respond when Koneko tugged at his sleeve. She looked at him, which Naruto correctly interpreted as, stop talking and let me buy my sweets. Sadao seemed to know that as well. Feel free to search my shop for whatever tickles your fancy. Will do, Naruto said. Sadao's sweets was made up of numerous aisles that contained all kinds of candy. Being unknowledgeable in the way of sweets, Naruto couldn't even name a tenth of what they perused. He merely followed Koneko as she grabbed several types of chocolate and some other sugary treats before having Sadao ring them up. Be sure to come back some time, Koneko. Sadao said as they were leaving. It sounds like that Sadao guy knows you pretty well, Naruto said as they wandered down the street. Koneko had already taken out one of her sweets, some manju, and was munching on it. Kuroka Neisama used to take me there before she betrayed her master. Whenever her master went to the capital for business, she and I would travel with him and so I ended up going to the store often. Naruto wondered if a day would ever come when Koneko realized the truth about her sister. He also wondered if he should really be keeping silent. It was true that he wanted Koneko to come to her own conclusions without him coloring her perceptions, but it was hard to see her think this way when he knew the truth. Thank you for taking me to Sadao's, Koneko said suddenly. Smiling as he placed his hand on the small of her back, Naruto said, you're welcome. Now, since we still have several hours before we need to get back to the hotel, what do you say we keep traveling around? I'd like to see more of the city. Koneko nodded, a smile appearing on her face. Let's. Devil Ninja. Rhea sighed as she took off her glasses, set them on the table, and then leaned back and slowly closed her eyes. Her notebook sat on the table in front of her. They contained all of the information she had compiled on the two rating games. Between the winners, she had to say that Cyrog was definitely the most dangerous of the two winners. That said, Lix wasn't someone she could afford to underestimate. We'll be fighting whoever wins between them. She wasn't sure who she wanted to win. Logic dictated that Lix would be easier to defeat, but if they fought Cyrog and won, it would help elevate her peerage's status in society. More than anything else, Rias wanted to prove her worth and those of her peerage. She wanted to make the members of her peerage shine brightly. More than anything else, she wanted people to know how amazing her friends, her family, was. Rubbing her eyes, Rias turned her head and looked out the window. I wonder how Naruto and Koneko are doing. Naruto had asked her if she wanted to travel with him to tour around the city. 
she had refused, stating that she wanted to compile the information she had, which was true, but the real reason was different. She simply wanted to give Koneko some time alone with him. The sound of a spring's creaking caused her to look at the bed, which office was suddenly and randomly lying stomach down on. How she had gotten there without alerting her, Rias had no idea. The infinite dragon god seemed capable of going wherever she pleased at will. Office, what are you reading? Rias asked as she stood up and stretched. She blinked when she felt a pair of eyes on her and looked back at Office. Is she staring at my bee? Rias Gremori, Office said. Let me touch your bee. Fwey, Devil Ninja. Naruto and Koneko were walking down the hallway of the hotel they were staying at. The warm lighting complemented the wooden walls and crimson floor, upon which their feet tread with a light thud that echoed across the hall. Koneko was carrying a bag of sweets in one hand while he held the other. They were within a meter of their apartment room. Aeon. When they both stopped. Did you hear that? Naruto asked. I did, Koneko said. Sounds like someone moaning in ecstasy. And no. Came the voice again. That came from our room, right? Naruto said. Koneko nodded. It did. I thought so. Naruto and Koneko stopped in front of the door and pressed an ear to it. Heavy breathing along with several moans reached them from the other side. Already experienced with the pitch and timber of those moans, Naruto knew exactly who was producing them. That sounds like Rias Buku. Koneko did, too, apparently. The next day was the rating game between the Gremory Peerage and Ruel's Brave Saints. Rias and her peerage were directed toward their starting point by Michael, while Ruel's group followed Sirex. Naruto could tell when they were transported to that other dimension. The air around them shifted, and the interior changed from a small room to a large, open plain. Blinking several times, Naruto looked at the sky. The swirling vortices that represented this dimension danced around in colorful patterns. It looked like this dimension was mostly an open plain with monolithic pillars of stone jutting from the surface. There must have been hundreds of them. They rose from the earth-like silent, unmoving golems, surrounding him and the others, and casting dark shadows along the ground. He judged the tallest one to be about 50 meters in height. These things are going to make finding our enemies difficult, Kiba said, staring up at the nearest pillar. But it also means they won't be able to find us as easily, Akino pointed out. Aside from that, all of us can fly. No. Rias shook her head. Take a look at how this dimension was set up. The tops of those pillars is the ceiling of this place. I suspect they realized we'd be able to fly off if they made an outside battleground and accounted for that in advance. Okay. Akino shrugged. So no flying. Do you have a plan? Naruto asked Rias. We don't know our enemy's capabilities, and we don't know the layout, Rias began. We can't rectify the first without battling Ruel and his brave saints, but we can at least fix the second problem. Naruto, send out as many clones as you can and have them scout the area. I want you to draw a map. Naruto grinned as he brought up his hands and formed a hand seal with his fingers. All right, let's start this game off with a bang. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. A massive amount of Naruto suddenly appeared before them. There must have been hundreds of them. They didn't waste a second before splitting up and running off, leaving the Gremory Peerage as eight once more. Well, that was an unusual sight, Kiba joked. I didn't know you could make that many clones, Issei said. I usually don't. Naruto shrugged. The cage bunch and no jutsu takes my chakra and splits it evenly between me and my clones. While this makes them indistinguishable from me, it also means that the more clones I make, the less chakra each one has. So the more clones you have, the weaker they are, Koneko said, nodding. Outside of Rias, she knew the most about his cloning technique, since he and Koneko trained together more often than the others. Right. When you create so many, they aren't very good in a fight. Which he had discovered the hard way back in his own world. He used to use them a lot in battle, but they would always get massacred. However, for scouting missions, clones are perfect. There wasn't much for them to do but wait until Naruto's clones dispelled themselves, so everyone did their best to make themselves comfortable. Naruto waited beside Rias. He glanced at the others. Kiba was leaning against one of the pillars, his arms crossed. Koneko was trying to pull the paper bag Gasper was wearing off of his head. Nu. No. Stop it, Konaku. 
Why? We're not in a crowd of people anymore. You should be fine without wearing that. But we're out C day. So, K Y A A A A A A. Poor kid. Realizing that he couldn't see Issei, Asia, and Akino, Naruto stood up and prepared to head out. If you're looking for Asia, Akino, and Eyes, they went around that pillar, Rias said, pointing to a specific pillar several meters away. I'd recommend giving them some time alone. I don't know what they're talking about, but it's probably best if we don't interfere. Isn't that what you told me? That this is their problem? Yeah, I did. Naruto sat back down. I guess I just can't help but feel worried. I'm worried too, Rias admitted. But you were right when you said we need to let them solve their own problems. I think we should do our best not to interfere. Naruto agreed with Rias, and so he ignored his inclination to check up on them. He was probably better off not knowing what they were talking about. It might make him want to interfere, which he didn't think they would appreciate. Just then, a familiar tickling sensation entered his mind. Images flashed before his eyes, like a video being replayed. He shifted. It looks like my clones are starting to dispel, Naruto said. How long will it take before all of them have dispelled? Asked Rias. I don't know. Naruto closed his eyes as a few more clones dispelled. I created about 200 clones, so there should be enough to thoroughly explore this level, but we don't know how big this place is, another clone just dispelled. This place will be about the same size as the Colosseum, Rias told him. Nodding, Naruto focused on disseminating all of the information he was now getting. It seemed like Rias was right. His clones were dispelling much faster now, and judging from what he was seeing, many of them had reached the end of the dimension. While most of them only gave Naruto a first-person map of the surrounding area, several of them had given Naruto a good surprise. I've found Ruel and his peerage, he said. Good. That means we can plan our strategy. Rias stood up and called for the others. Kiba, Koneko, and a frightened gasper came over to her. Issei, Asia, and Akino did not. Naruto, can you bring them back here for me? She asked. Sure thing. Naruto wandered around the large pillar. He found the trio easily enough. Asia and Issei were standing on one side and Akino stood apart from them. She looked uncomfortable. They all did, but Naruto had the sense that Akino was the most self-conscious person there. While he was loath to stop what appeared to be such an important discussion, Naruto knew that the rating game took precedence right now. Hey, you three, Naruto called out to them. It's time to come up with a plan of action. We need you guys with us. All right, Issei called back before turning back to Akino. Listen, Akino Issei, I mean, Akino. You don't have to answer right now, but I, no, we would really appreciate if you could at least think about it. Akino looked like she wanted to draw into herself and hide. She looked away and grasped her elbow as though she was a schoolgirl talking to a guy who made her uncomfortable. I, can't promise anything. We know, Asia said softly. Just, please think about it. I can at least do that, Akino agreed with a rare smile. The trio walked up to Naruto and they all traveled back over to Rias, who was waiting patiently for him to return with the others. Her eyes lit up when she saw him. She then gestured for him and the others to join up with Kiba, Koneko, and Gasper, which they did. Once they were all there, she explained their strategy. Since we don't know how powerful anyone in Ruel's brave saints are, I think we should take them out individually, Rias explained. We'll have Naruto use his clones to separate each member and lead them into an ambush. How many people are we using for these ambushes? Asked Kiba. Are we going all out, or should we have some people in reserve? Because neither the brave saints of the fallen angel peerages could use promotion, there was no need for them to guard their starting point. The goal was not to get your pawns from one side to the other. This had been a new rule they implemented since only devil peerages used chess-based rules in their fights. Since there are eight of us here, I think moving in groups of four would work best, Rias said. I'll lead one group and Akino will lead the other. Eyes, Asia, and Kiba, you three are going to be with me. Akino, you'll take Naruto, Gasper, and Koneko. Naruto, can you create a few clones? One of them will go with me. I want the others to keep their eyes on our opponents and dispel whenever they change direction. That'll take a lot of clones, Naruto said. Is it unfeasible? Thinking about Rias's question for a moment, Naruto eventually shook his head. No, 
I can create a couple thousand if need be. The problem is that more clones means less places where they can hide. Why don't you split your chakra four ways? Suggested Koneko. One can go with Buku, and then you can have two that scout ahead. Since your chakra is evenly split, they should have enough to create a clone of their own and dispel. That would work in the short term, but not the long term, Naruto said. When a clone dispels, the chakra is lost. If I created three clones, and one of those clones created another clone that immediately dispelled itself, the clone in question would only have half of its chakra, which is a third of my chakra. But you have a lot of that chakra stuff, right? Issei asked. It shouldn't matter if you lose some. No. Naruto is correct, Rias said. We don't know how powerful our enemy is. We should conserve our strength as much as possible. She thought for a moment. Okay. Naruto, give me the general location of our opponents. We'll split into groups of three and attack based off that knowledge. I don't think I need to tell any of you this, but be careful. Everyone nodded at her words, and with their teams set, the two groups split up. Come on, you three, Akino said. Let's go. Kiba, Koneko, and Naruto followed Akino. As they were leaving, Naruto noticed Akino glance at Issei and Asia one last time before Rias's group disappeared from sight. That will be all for this video, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment down below for more videos, goodbye.